So my name is, is John Abrashkin. Uh, I'm a Marketing and Business Development Director at Honeybee Robotics, uh, based in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And I really appreciate the chance to, to come talk to the New Space uh, crowd tonight. Um, because in some ways, uh, Honeybee is you know, the, the older generation of space companies in New York, and uh, maybe operating on a little bit different business model. Um, but uh, I think with a lot of uh, interesting projects under our belt, and also um, some uh, innovative ideas and technology that we're working on for future space missions. So I have not given a long talk in the last year or so. Everything's usually cut to 20 minutes. So two things about that. Um, first, this is going to be a little bit disjointed, talking about different parts of our business, uh, because we work in a few different sectors. Uh, and second, it's really boring just to hear somebody talk at you for an hour. So I would, I would much prefer, if you've got some questions or input from your own experience, uh, please let me know, because otherwise um, this is going to get uh, a little monotonous. Uh, but uh, we do a lot of work in Mars, and we do a lot of work uh, also in more spacecraft systems for, for satellites and aerospace. Uh, but the, the whole MO of Honeybee is to build um, electromechanical and robotic systems for tough environments when people can't find something commercially available. Uh, you know, pretty much everybody wants just a, a cot system uh, that they can buy from, from a catalog. But uh, usually when it comes to specialized tasks and tough environments, uh, that doesn't work because uh, something you buy off the shelf either is not going to meet you know, certain size, weight, and power constraints, or it's not going to survive a harsh environment of extreme temperature, debris, vibration, radiation, what have you. So um, we do everything from kind of early stage white papers and feasibility studies to uh, concept generation and prototyping. Uh, we'll build functional prototypes in the lab. Uh, we'll build flight models, and we'll, we'll do the whole verification validation, and then support everything up to flight and beyond, because we actually do a lot of uh, uh, surface operations uh, with uh, NASA Goddard and the Jet Propulsion Lab for the Mars rovers. Um, so I'm going to get into the company's history just a little bit to give some flavor here. But uh, on the left is our old office on West 34th Street and 10th Ave, where we were for a decade. A year ago, we moved into the Navy Yard. And on the right is going to be our future home. Uh, it's a little bit too shiny to be real because it's a rendering. Uh, but New Lab is going to be an amazing space uh, in Building 128 in the Navy Yard. And the idea is to have um, room for about 350 or 400 people, uh, small companies and some individual designers with, set, with uh, separate and private design space, but sharing uh, fabrication and manufacturing hardware. So you know we can't afford to buy all the beautiful printers uh, that we want. But everybody will have shared access to like nice printers and CNC machines and laser cutters uh, and all the, all the beautiful fabrication hardware you wish you could keep in-house, if you could justify it from a cost perspective. Um, overall, the company is about 60 people. And uh, the New York uh, office remains the headquarters. Uh, but the other two offices, just full disclosure, have been doing a lot more of our core space work over the last 10 years or so. Um, in Colorado, there's a small aerospace hub um, with both uh, prime contractors and subcontractors in the Air Force. And we do a lot of aerospace subsystems there. Uh, and out in California, in Pasadena, we're, we're uh, about five minutes away from the Jet Propulsion Lab. So we have a team out there doing work on uh, sampling systems and uh, a lot of drilling, you know, surface operations, stuff that JPL is interested in. Uh, and so that leaves New York as kind of this, this weird, omnivorous group of projects where we're doing work in medical devices, uh, uh, infrastructure inspection, and space systems kind of all at the same time. And um, it leads to some, some strange cross-pollination of, of technologies and, and, and mindset. Uh, in terms of our business, maybe 60% of our work is for NASA, give or take. We do quite a bit of work with uh, Defense Department as well. And when you think about new space, you know, I think there's a few different definitions. But, but generally, the idea is you're using kind of commercial technology to exploit um, the, the economic opportunities in space for, for private ventures. Uh, we do some work commercially. But a lot of the work is kind of the bread and butter NASA-funded exploration. Um, 
you know, SBIRs, direct procurement, research grants in partnership with academic institutions. So it's kind of, um, it's not quite the same kind of new space people would expect if you're, if you're you know, throwing a cell phone up on a CubeSat, um, but there's a lot of interesting exploration that might lead to commercial ventures when you think about NASA technology making way for companies like Planetary Resources or Shackleton Energy or, or some of the other more commercially minded ventures. Um, and this is the last kind of promotional slide that we often show clients. Um, you know, we're, we're known for building very reliable systems for tough environments. Uh, when you launch something, you get one chance. So uh, we test the hell out of stuff and um, can operate in very, very kind of dirty and unpredictable environments. Um, we are in the mid 400s right now on the number of projects we've worked on. So we've, we've gotten the project cycle down pretty well and we, we can anticipate costs. Um, and then also just uh, on a more kind of engineering level, you know, we've got mechanical and electrical engineers and the computer scientists and control systems guys who, uh, who all work very tightly together. So you know, the end result is something that um, has a physical form that integrates um, you know, the, the, the functionality from an electromechanical perspective and also the, the user interface um, much more tightly than if you build a beautiful mechanism and, and slap an electronics board on it. Uh, some of the things that bring people to Honeybee are not the, not the exorbitant salaries, but the ability to work on some, some cool stuff. So we, uh, we, we build stuff in the lab, we try to simulate things in you know, space analog environments, uh, but then we'll take it to places like the dry valleys of Antarctica on the top left. Um, we'll go up to, to Greenland on the bottom left, um, do some work uh, in Mars analog conditions in, in the Atacama Desert, uh, over on the right side, and actually this here where I'm making a shadow puppet is um, uh, one of the, it's the Zoe rover with Carnegie Mellon, and uh, despite the BMX wheels, it's a very sophisticated rover. So we built the, a sampling system to test for subterranean life on Mars uh, in a really hostile environment where it's tough to find microbial life. Um, sent some guys up on the Vomit Comet to do microgravity sampling, and uh, we've even done some work with the New Jersey and New York police departments on their bomb squad robots. Um, New Jersey State Police have the, the biggest civilian bomb squad uh, in the US. Um, so they've got a big fleet and a lot of operational needs. So that's kind of that's the very high level. Before I take a deep dive into some of the more arcane stuff, any, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, quick question. Uh, for these kind of uh, remote tests, are they funded by your customers or are they internally funded? Almost everything we do is um, the, the traditional fee-for-service model. So um, if we're going to be building, say, a, a new sampling system, um, it might start out as like an SBIR through NASA or, um, or another government agency. Uh, we'll build it up to a certain technology readiness level. Maybe we'll get a direct grant to bring it up from TRL-5 up to TRL-7, and then we'll get a separate grant um, to, to test out in the field. And often the field tests are in conjunction with um, some kind of research institution. So we'll work with like Carnegie Mellon or other people who are kind of part of the pipeline for NASA. Um, and we, we actually have a very small internal R&D budget. Almost everything is um, funded by the end users. And you know the reasoning behind that is, is um, the scientists generally set the mission, and then the engineers have to figure out how to get the data the scientists want. So when it comes to you know, sampling geology or water or organics on Mars, um, the scientists say what kind of data they want, and then it's up to NASA uh, and its uh, vendor network, more or less, to, to figure out how to get that data to the scientists. Um, so, you know, in, in that way, you know, our fate is not entirely in our hands. We're very reactive and responsive to what people need rather than proposing, you know, a whole mission architecture for ourselves. And actually, I think that that'll feed into a little bit of the, the space sampling work um, later on. Um, so I wanted to give you guys a, a little flavor of the early years, like the first 20 years or so before getting up to the, cur the current stuff. Um, we've got... Chuck Hoberman here on the top left. There we go. Um, you guys might know him from the Hoberman Sphere. Um, very cool 
uh, uh, collapsible structures. And we were based um, at a few offices for the first 20 years down on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, on Elizabeth Street in Ludlow. And um, Pianos is now a, a nice bar and performance space, uh, but we had a, we had a facility uh, upstairs doing engineering. And you get stuff like, um, uh, the, the early Honeybee actually for the first like three or four years was very much focused on uh, being an integrator of commercial robotic systems. So, you know, companies like IBM or, or, um, or Foster Miller were, or Allied Signal were interested in deploying robots, but they didn't have any expertise. So we would come in and essentially figure out what they were trying to solve and then set this thing up and act like kind of drop-in consultants. Um, and so you see here we have a, um, a commercially available six degree of freedom robot uh, and we, we built a custom end effector. Um, and this was for um, uh, Halmet, uh, one of the Alcoa companies. They wanted a pin insertion for like a wax mold system. Um, so, you know, in retrospect, pretty simple stuff, but uh, the, the actual robot only made up about a third of the cost, and there's all this overhead in the expertise of setting things up and debugging and maintaining. Uh, and so we could be kind of that, uh, that drop-in solution. Uh, but our chairman, who all, I've got a, a pretty awesome picture of later, uh, was, was always interested in space. So back in 86, we got our first contract with NASA, um, with, with Langley. And the idea was to build these, these expandable uh, space structures, these kind of mini habitats for astronauts doing uh, EVA activity. Um, that's redundant, but EVA is to uh, essentially shield them in the event something might have gone wrong. And there's this whole burst of, of interest in robotics for space applications after the Challenger. So Langley became this, this, this big champion of Honeybee's skill set. Chuck Hoberman had a lot of experience with um, almost origami style, um, expandable, uh, buildable structures. And we ended up working on some very cool on-orbit uh, assembly projects for Langley. Uh, and this is, this is one of the first large-scale projects. Uh, here on the bottom left, we have a 20-meter uh, wide truss. And the idea was to, to launch a bunch of these individual um, you know, rods and, and joints and then assemble it in space for things like um, you know, near and, and far infrared telescopes that would be too big to, to fit in a spacecraft. So um, side to side, this is about, this is about 20 meters uh, in, in diameter. And the idea was to build it using a, a totally human-free system. So we, we've got uh, a little close-up here of the, of the system we built. You can see uh, the, the truss rendering over on the right. Um, but, but the idea was essentially to have stuff that normally an astronaut would do uh, replaced by a robotic system for, to, to protect uh, humans. Um, and it even included a very primitive uh, vision system where you have essentially a bunch of candidate blobs that would be resolved into um, kind of a triangulated structure on the bottom right. Um, a little hard to see because we scan these from pictures from back in the 80s. Uh, but what was really cool is you, you ended up comparing in this test lab a commercially available six-doff uh, robot with our custom end effectors, uh, and you, you stack them up against robots doing simulated spacewalks um, uh, in the underwater uh, uh, test rig, and the robot performed really well. Um, and, and I think that the key takeaway was if you can design these trusses, to be robotically manipulated rather than trying to retrofit uh, something that was designed for a human. Um, you, can, you can do stuff very efficiently, very precisely, uh, and with a pretty low um, uh, mass overhead. Uh, so the follow-on to that, again, in the, con in the construct of um, NASA's real, real risk aversion after Challenger, was to take robotic assembly and build a whole space station rather than just um, a, big, a big telescope. Um, anybody remember like sta Space Station Freedom? Okay, so, so this, this is a rendering uh, or an artist's impression. Um, this was kind of the, it was announced during the Reagan years and it was a precursor to the ISS. Um, and you can see 
all along the spine, there's this big tetrahedral uh, truss uh, providing the, the backbone of a space station that was going to be a majority American built. And, um, and the idea was to do a lot of this construction with um, this uh, three-armed robot uh, called the Flight Telerobotic Servicer. And Honeybee had done a lot of work in manipulation, custom end effectors. So we were tasked with how to, how to construct all these, these big truss structures. So we built some, some prototypes, which you know, for the late 80s, I think this is a pretty high fidelity plastic prototype. Um, here are some pictures of the, of the metal version. Um, and eventually, we, we came up with the system right here that is or was the, um, the, the main end effector for this Lockheed Martin built uh, flight telerobotic servicer that was supposed to help construct um, space station freedom. And that eventually, due to budget cuts, um, a lot of this vision was folded into the ISS. And Canada contributed this you know, big, beautiful uh, Canada arm. Um, but originally, it had been uh, Lockheed building um, this, this uh, end effector, here, or this, this, this robotic arm, and us the end effector that would have done a lot of the things that would otherwise would have required spacewalks. Uh, in, the same, in the same vein, we did a lot of work on these kind of origami-inspired expandable structures. So launching um, something in you know, the largest commercial fairing available and then having it expand out uh, almost you know, organically into a very large uh, antenna structure. And the idea there is, is um, take advantage of you know, small commercially available fairings and um, you know, potentially have big communications arrays, deep space uh, telescopes, you know, Earth observing uh, information, et cetera. Um, so at the same time as we're doing that, that's all through like the mid to late 80s and early 90s. At the same time, Honeybee was working on some, some kind of bespoke commercial systems. Um, if anybody was around in, in New York uh, about 25 years ago, they, they might have seen this big Coca-Cola sign in Times Square. And uh, this was a pretty cool structure. It had like this big Coke bottle that would kind of fill up from the bottom and then the top would pop off and a straw would, would, would uh, come out the top. And you had these, these um, five segments up on top that would rotate between Coke and Coke Classic and Diet Coke. And uh, at the time, apparently, it was like the biggest installation using harmonic drives uh, in the world. So we would go up, we, we designed this, we installed it, we would go up in, in the cold winter months uh, when the pigeons would roost inside and short out a lot of the circuits and we'd have to debug it. Um, but you know, a lot of visibility. And actually, there, there was a Budweiser ad immediately across Times Square that we worked on too. Um, <laughs> not very easy to replicate this kind of work. Um, but we've also done some, some stuff with uh, Con Edison and other utilities. Uh, if you ever see steam pouring out of the streets here, it's because uh, one of the, the couple hundred miles of steam pipes under the streets has sprung a leak. Um, generally, you know, they're, they're constructed in 20-foot sections, and they've got, they've got a flange. Um, and uh, sometimes the, the gasket, which is just like jute or other organic material, would degrade over you know, half a century. Uh, you'd spring a leak, and Con Ed would have to dig up you know, a big chunk of the street in order to, to fix this. So the idea was a little bit ahead of its time, but this, this uh, welding and inspection steam operations robot called Wiser uh, there's a, a, a documentary of questionable entertainment made about it. Um, but, but the idea of this system was instead of digging up every time there's a, there's a leak in one of these flanges, uh, you, you dig once and you send this robot down and it can fix multiple flanges at a time, mill out the corroded uh, jute or other material, and then weld a nice new bead and um, do a lot of preventative maintenance. So it worked about 80% of the way. The, one of the problems was in the, um, you got, you got a, a milling section and a welding section. We were trying to do welds in the full 360 and um, kind of in like the 1130 to 1230 overhead range, the welds ended up dripping a lot of slag. Because, you know, I mean, we were building this with, with pre-internet technology. So um, wasn't quite the sophistication you'd expect uh, today. Uh, so we got about 80%, 90% of the way there. 
wasn't quite good enough to go into to full operations, but I think it's a cool concept. And you see it now with companies like um, ULC out in Long Island uh, with their SysBot platform doing uh, a lot of preventative maintenance on gas mains. Um, okay, so that's, that's like all early stuff. Uh, I can get into the current things. Any, any questions though? So I would assume that there's some IP related to patent patents related to things like this? We're, uh, we're, we're not aggressive patenters. Uh, it's, there's a lot of um, trade knowledge and process knowledge. So uh, in the case of Wiser, I think we were using um, some, some custom stuff, but a lot of off-the-shelf systems combined in new ways. Um, probably could have been a little more aggressive in patenting, but there's some overhead in that, so. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so I mean, I think, I think Con Edison still has this issue where you see, you know, you see the big chimneys pouring steam out, um, and you see them working, you know, from 10 a.m. to 4 a.m. or whatever hours they're allowed to work and disrupt the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, for like, for weeks on end. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it's a big issue, and it's, uh, they're a conservative, you know, company because they've got, you know, millions of neighbors, so um, uh, introducing a new robotic system is, is challenging when, they're, when they have a, a way of doing business that works well enough. Yes? How big do those hexagonal uh, structures stand? Oh, yeah, so this is, um, you're talking about the, the, this truss structure? Oh, um, yeah, this, this array. Yeah, the yeah. Starburst. Yeah, so the Starburst, uh, it's on the order of 20 meters. I'm not sure exactly how big it is, but it was, <laughs> it was in a, a, a fairing that was, um, I think, about like three and a half or four meters, give or take. Um, so it was about 20 meters, give or take, deployed. So they're basically So the idea here is everything is, is um, uh, contained within the folded structure up on the top left. And then once it's deployed um, from a spacecraft, it would then go through a series of kind of organic um, unfolding and deploy completely without it. So it, it's, a, it's a little different from the assembly concept. Um, instead, you have kind of a sequential unfolding, almost like a, like a flower you know, blossoming. Is yeah. This, oh, I oh, is this a processor to Starship? Our, our work with Langley, I think, wrapped up around this time. Um, they had lost a little bit of funding for on-orbit uh, assembly and, and large space structures. So um, I, I don't have a whole lot of insight into what came after this. Because by, by the mid-90s, we had kind of pivoted to some of the planetary surface operations. Because it looks like, a lot like yeah. Starshade, which JPL has been working on. I mean, there's, there's echoes of like, you know, I, I don't know if the Jim Webb Space Telescope is, is inspired by this stuff. But yeah, big hex, hexagonal um, structures that deploy on orbit. So, yeah. I was actually going to ask about James Webb and this. It's really similar, except James Webb unfolds just really simply as opposed to this more organic. So did this have applications in more hyperspin telescopes, or was the organic nature <coughs> too rough on the tolerance things so you couldn't use it for really precise things like that? Um, Slash, do you know what Okay, I mean, this is going to be speaking a little above my pay grade, but my sense is that the precision of something like a deep space telescope probably demands a simpler unfolding, and this, this might have been good for a large aperture or a large array, um, but there's probably a lot more built-in um, slop. I like more, I mean, the actual ocean heat, actual optical also element itself, definitely, but I was thinking more along the lines of the, um, the sun shield, the paper. Oh, yeah. Bottom, because that took a lot of time to get the unfolding of the rigging right, and I think it was just this. <coughs> Oh, it's not exactly that tight at all. Is it, essentially, you mean the, the Mylar sheets? Yeah, it's yeah. Mylar sheet because they had to do this crazy um, explosive, basically adding borders in space to actually get things to fire in the right order. This seems a lot simpler. Ah, that would be awesome. Maybe, maybe not the case. Yeah, I mean, I, and this might have been more massive than they were willing to. That's cool. To, to and then also, can suffer. you scale that down? The second question is, can you scale this down to, say, 10 by 10 by 30? Um, I mean, I think, I think fundamentally this is, this yeah. is scalable. Um, I mean, the, the challenge is always to find something that um, 
has a, a, a limited diameter starting point you know, to get it out into the, the area you need, and then it deploys. Um, most places are not quite so um, weight and volume restricted as Space Launch. But I mean, it, no, I, mean yeah. I, I mean, nanosats, 10 by 10 by 30 centimeters, oh. 3 few cents. Yeah, I don't see why not. Okay, there's no functional limitation, all the strength materials, and the you have to use. Um, again, it's, it's a little before my time, so wouldn't want to make promises, but um, depending on the stiffness you need, in theory, it should be possible, especially if you're going to be have just kind of a passive array that doesn't have a lot of load on it. You're thinking about like for a 3U kind of CubeSat? Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. How would you do the actuators in such a small size? In this case, I imagine mean, it's a pretty larger, yeah, normal size actuators. Um, my understanding with, was that this, this was passively deployed. Um, we've done a lot of work in um, uh, spring-loaded um, solar array deployment. And I'm, I might be wrong about this in terms of starburst, uh, but my understanding was it's there's a lot of potential energy contained in, in the springs, and then it would slowly unfold um, based on the, the energy of the springs and the, the friction in the system. We do we do a lot of work in in kind of um, you know interesting but but kind of bread and butter uh, spacecraft systems. So uh, this is STP Sat one. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the Department of Defense's uh, technology testing platforms. Uh, I think they're up to five now. Uh, and we, we built the solar array deployment systems for this. Um, very high stiffness, um, essentially deploy and lock in a fixed configuration. Um, and uh, we've also worked with uh, um, NSPO, the Taiwanese Space Agency, for Formosat 5, which is going to launch, um, I think it slipped to next year. Um, but, you know. Got to, array deploy, uh, got to deploy solar arrays. Uh, and then we also do um, solar array drive actuators for CubeSats. So uh, this, this is about as thin as, as the iPhone 5, maybe a little off spec from the iPhone 6. But um, the idea is uh, there's some gaps between the CubeSat and the P-Pod where it launches from. And you can actually stick uh, this little, actu this little uh, uh, drive assembly on the end of a 3U CubeSat um, without changing the, the deployment configuration uh, and have totally actuated solar arrays to you know, double or triple the, the on-orbit power available. Uh, so we've done a little bit of work with um, some companies on uh, solar panels that deploy. Uh, nothing's flown yet, but the product remains available. Um, for microsats, we, we've built a line of uh, miniature uh, control moment gyroscopes. So normally for, for small sats, you've got um, you know, micro thrusters for attitude control, or which, which have a, a limit in terms of the propellant available, or you have a, a reaction wheel where it spins at a, um, a variable rate. And as you, as you spin up or down, you can use the torque um, to, to change the attitude of the spacecraft. Um, control moment gyroscopes are pretty common on large spacecraft, but we've, we've shrunk them down to the size of about a golf ball. And the idea is to combine them in an array of, of two to four and have total attitude control for small sats, like up to about 150 to 200 kilograms. Um, so if you want to take a picture of a few different, or, or of the same spot from a few different points in orbit, um, you know, you think about low Earth orbit, you're just cooking around it at uh, such a high speed, you need a very high slew rate to stay focused on the same spot. I'm, I'm sorry, what's the size, weight, form factor of mm. these? Um, so this is, this is a functional prototype that we were testing compared to a golf ball. Um, okay. This is, you know, for, for gross um, uh, uh, size. Um, and we, we've been putting them in arrangements of three or four. Um, so, so in theory, you could fit it in something as small as like a 3U CubeSat. Might be a little bit overkill for that, but... Um, if you have a, a, a microsat that weighs on the order of 100 to 200 kilograms, it would be a really good fit for that. And um, you know, the idea is to get about an order of magnitude better um, uh, attitude control compared to a reaction wheel uh, from a similar size platform. Yeah. The question of the intercept, um, so <laughs> for the actuating the solar panels, mm -hmm. um, 
You said it hasn't flown yet. Do you know when it is going to fly? Do you have anyone definitely using it? I don't think we have a launch manifest. We had we had partnered with a company for uh, what was called the Hawk H A W K, and um, it was it was an interesting system in concept where you had um, our solar array drive actuator combined with their uh, very thin film um, arrays, and it would kind of fold down two sides of the three U cube sat, come out, and then each panel would fold out to, to triple in surface area. Um, I'm not sure why we haven't flown yet. It's there might not be a system that needs that much power. Maybe just fixed, you know, solar arrays on the side is enough. Um, it might be a little too expensive for you know for the value it provides. I'm not quite sure. Question yeah. on the drivers. Uh, a lot of satellites have problems with drivers. They, they seem to fail on a, or on, a, on a reliable basis. They they can they will fail. What's yeah. uh, have you found out why that is and why yours won't fail? Um, they, yeah, they're, it's, it's, it's much more difficult than a reaction wheel from an engineering perspective. Um, I don't know the root cause. We've been doing some testing with the Air Force Research Lab on this, and the idea was to fly it on a test mission that AFRL sponsors. Um, I, I don't know enough to speak intelligently about it, but it's, it's more challenging than it looks like. These things are just just cooking, you know. I, th I think it's, it might just be a, a, a materials issue. Um, you have masses going at such high speeds in a relatively small volume. Um, there's a lot of force on a relatively small area. Um, and then also, you know, uh, there are twist capsules and slip rings if you need to transfer power or signal over a rotating interface, like, um, you know, from a solar array as it's, as it's um, uh, moving relative to the spacecraft, we'll build a lot of custom systems, um, and even you know gearheads and drive assemblies. Um, cryogenic space does some weird stuff to, to metals, um, you know, all the way up to we work on on concepts for the surface of Venus, where it's um, you know about 460 degrees Celsius. So you just have have these huge um, temperature issues, and it, it does some unpredictable things to um, well, you know what should be otherwise pretty straightforward planetary drive systems. So, um, you know, maybe not the most exciting new space uh, systems, but, but kind of the bread and butter of making a spacecraft work. Um, and likewise, you know, we do motor controllers. So we've got uh, eight axis universal motor controllers for um, things like brushless DC motors. If you need to do any kind of actuation on a spacecraft, um, you know, a very small platform uh, for the kind of control you have. Uh, we, we've, we've actually taken a lot of these concepts and integrated them into more um, fleshed out subsystems rather than just kind of component level items, um, like autonomous docking systems for uh, power, data, and even pneumatic like fluid or gas transfer. Um, and so this could be used for things like uh, rovers docking into a spacecraft on the moon or on Mars autonomously. With, with gross and then fine alignment, um, uh, even in the presence of dust. Or, you know, in theory, if you have a space suit that needs to dock in um, to a spacecraft during an EVA and you want to have, you know, gas and fluids and, and power transfer, um, you can do stuff uh, with, with this concept we've generated. Um, probably don't need to get too much into detail on this, but NASA was, was pretty interested in it. Yes. Um, so for this and your eight axis, for example, uh, what what TRL would you call that? Yeah, the the eight axis motor controller is probably um, TRL six or so. We've, I mean, it's it's a, a fundamentally rad hardened architecture. Um, and we've, we've done a lot of lab tests. Um, we're, get, we're, we're trying to fly this on some demo missions, but you know, as everybody who's done this knows, like, there's this, there's this catch-22 about flight heritage. You know. do you have your own lab that all this stuff? Um, so we develop it in the lab, and then we'll work with, um, often we'll work with, with test facilities to validate it. So if you, 
Yeah, we'll, we'll work with test facilities to validate it. So, um, you know, if we, if we need like a high radiation environment or extreme temperatures, um, in, at Honeybee we have a couple vacuum chambers down to like 10 to the minus 6 tor and we can do cryogenic temperatures. Um, we've got a dirty vacuum chamber where we can test stuff for like uh, simulating the surface of the moon or, or Mars. Uh, but then there's other, other things like uh, vibration tables that we'll, we'll just work with a, a vendor for to, to make sure it's not going to shake apart. Um, and then two other things before I get into to some of the cool planetary work we're, we're doing. Um, has anybody here heard of DARPA Phoenix? Okay, so um, uh, just the, the high level overview is, you know, on-orbit satellite servicing has been uh, of high interest for refueling. A lot of that work is being done out of NASA Goddard um, in the Satellite Servicing Capabilities Office, but uh, there's this other idea from DARPA where you have uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, where you have all these old satellites up in geostationary orbit uh, with very valuable hardware that would be expensive to launch um, a, a second time, uh, but for some reason they're not functional. Like the electronics are fried or they've run out of propellant. Um, they might be just sitting in the graveyard orbit, otherwise, otherwise relatively functional. So the idea is to have this, this um, satellite servicing um, um, module go up to an old defunct satellite and actually bolt on kind of new Lego style microsatellites or, or nano satellites really um, called satlets and each of these would be uh, able to provide modular capabilities like power, guidance and navigation, uh, communications and uh, we are providing the, the end effectors to physically grapple with the target satellite and manipulate these little satlets onto some, some docking areas. And the idea is, you know, essentially you've got satellite and an array connected by some kind of boom. And so this, this universal gripper anchor will catch onto the boom, um, and then this little uh, satlet grasper tool will um, grab a little satlet and mount it onto one of these docking stations. And you should be able to, like, daisy chain them because uh, there's a common male and female interface. So almost like Lego building blocks, you should be able to just stack them up um, and add new capabilities, you know. So could be, um, you know, reviving an old satellite or potentially adding new communications channels to an existing satellite, et cetera. Um, and then finally, before we get to planetary stuff, we've, we've applied some of this thinking about very limited size, weight, and power to very small crawlers for industrial needs. Uh, so we're working with the uh, Northeast Gas Association, a, a utility trade company, to build little crawlers for um, uh, cased pipe inspection. And the idea is, uh, if you imagine this is a carrier pipe, like maybe an 18 to 24 inch gas line, um, you have a casing around it if it goes underneath a railroad or it's near a population center. And right now to inspect it, the utility has to dig this up. Excavation is very expensive and disruptive. And the only way in to get a set of eyes inside to make sure nothing's cracked or corroded is through these little vent pipes, which are, are two inches in diameter. So we built this little crawler. Uh, it's got five actuators inside, um, front, rear, and top cameras. Um, and it's teleoperated, so it's got a tether providing uh, power and signal, and it's uh, controlled by a technician up on the, on the surface. But it, climb, it, it crawls down through 20 or so feet of small diameter pipe, and then essentially you get a set of eyes inside um, this area that would otherwise be inaccessible, save a backhoe. So we've got a lot of planetary stuff we're working on. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you guys' ears off. Um, okay. So um, everybody's familiar with, with Mars exploration, right? Um, okay, so I don't want to belabor the point. Sometimes people are, are completely ignorant about this stuff, but the, the, the high level is that Honeybee has done a lot of work on planetary exploration. Um, and we've contributed to the last three generations of Mars landers that NASA sent. Um, and we're working on some, some futuristic concepts for uh, planetary sampling, not only on Mars, but places like Europa and Enceladus. Uh, comets, asteroids, and lunar samples, 
pretty much anywhere you'd want to send a, a rover for, or a lander for science missions or commercial ventures. Um, so I'm going to kind of breeze through a little bit of this, but I think it's, it's worth seeing the last like 100 years of, of Mars exploration for context to figure out why Curiosity is so cool. And uh, Steve Gorvan is the, the co-founder of the, the company. He's our technical chief on a lot of planetary work. Um, we've got a, a pretty baller picture of him with, with Curiosity. And this is a talk that he loves to give. So I'm, I'm going to be his surrogate for a minute. Um, and he likes to talk about how, you know, 100, 110 years ago, uh, over on the right is the, the best picture of Mars anybody could get from, from uh, Earth-based satellites. And, you know, due to optical illusions and the floaties in people's eyes, they, they thought they saw these, you know, incredibly complex canals and, and structures. And so the idea was, you know, there, there must be life, sophisticated life on Mars. Let's go find it. You know, and it, it took another uh, five or six decades before we had the technical chops to, to take any pictures. But there were some really high hopes when Mariner 4 did a flyby. Uh, NASA didn't have the technology to, to put anything in orbit at that point. Um, but, but Mariner 4 was the first uh, spacecraft to take close pictures of, of Mars. And uh, it had time to take 22 pictures total for the whole mission. Um, and the idea was we we're going to find some amazing sophistication and instead, these black and white pictures, you know, showed this, this totally lifeless surface that looked like the moon, just pockmarked craters. Um, so that was in the mid-60s. There was a lot of disappointment. Um, I, re I love asking school kids who this guy is. Nobody has any clue. And, uh, but, but Carl Sagan was, you guys probably remember, the, the champion for Viking. And the idea was to do uh, direct tests for life from this lander platform. And there were very high hopes, but in general, the consensus is that the direct test for life came back um, more or less negative. And that was a, a big blow to planetary exploration. So as, as Steve likes to say, for you know, 20 more years, there, weren't, there wasn't really a whole lot of interest in going back to Mars. It, it seemed like a, kind of a sterile, boring place. Uh, but during that time, we were doing a lot of these field tests that, that I, I talked about. Um, you know, essentially, as a small business, finding this niche that nobody else was all that interested in because it wasn't commercially exploitable. Um, so, we're, so we're building all these sampling systems at the same time as, as biologists are finding some, uh, some amazing things about life on, on Earth. Um, you know, life teeming not just in the, the kind of wet um, algal, you know, environments you'd expect, but this is a, an electron microscope uh, image of uh, bacteria inside rock. So you're finding life in these extreme environments, hydrothermal vents uh, up in the Arctic, very slow growing compounds. Um, you know, these, these archaea that are, um, uh, uh, you know, living off of reduced metal compounds rather than carbon material. Um, essentially this, this, you know, expanding view of, of how life can exist. And the reason that these, this research is interesting is, um, Back in uh, the, the uh, late 90s or, or mid 90s, um, scientists were taking a, a fresh look at an asteroid, or a meteorite rather, that had come uh, from Mars that landed in Antarctica. And the reason researchers knew that it came from Mars is there were small gas pockets, um, and the gas matched the composition of what Viking had found um, about 20 years before. So. Uh, Clinton, and actually it's fun to ask school kids who this guy is as well. <laughs> uh, Clinton had a you know, press conference in the Rose Garden, uh, and all of a sudden like, the hunt was on for, for life on Mars, because not only did this meteorite look like it had come from Mars, but it looked like it had fossilized bacteria in it, um, which probably wasn't the case, but uh, it looked very tantalizing. So all of a sudden we, we had Viking back in the 70s, this, this one-dimensional exploration of Mars. And now the new concept is instead of landing and sampling, we're going to do this 2D exploration. We're going to land somewhere and drive. Um, and you probably remember Sojourner, the little rover on the Pathfinder mission. <coughs> kind of a proof of concept. Showed that you can actually crash land um, uh, a vehicle and, uh, and have it function on Mars. Uh, and so the first 
you know, I would say real science platform uh, was, was uh, Spirit and Opportunity, the, the twin uh, Mars exploration rovers uh, that landed in, in uh, 2004. Um, and as, as you guys probably know, uh, Opportunity is still alive and kicking. Uh, completed a, a marathon earlier this year, I think about 26 miles, which is pretty impressive. Um, and I'm, I'm sometimes curious whether people who thought they were signing up for like a 90 day mission knew they would be getting into like 13 years of their life here. Um, but but uh, one of the big challenges was, you know, NASA wanted to be very, very um, sequential in how they studied Mars. And so one of the first things you do is, is you look at the rocks, right, and you, you understand the history of the planet. So if you're, if you're a field geologist, maybe you find a high point, you, you, you find a rock that looks interesting, you walk over to it, crack it open, and, and put a scope uh, to the rock and, and take a look. Uh, and doing that with, with a very small robotic platform that you know, is on the order of about 100 kilograms is, is really tough. Um, so NASA had this idea, JPL was thinking about, you know, do we blast the rocks open with kind of almost a pyrotechnic or, or violent charge? Um, and instead, uh, they went with, with our approach, which is kind of a, a glorified um, rotary sander. The idea is to abrade the, the top few millimeters of a rock that's been eroded by, by the wind and, and hit by ra uh, radiation and get to some virgin rock underneath. And you, just, you can see like the, the, the huge difference in mineral composition. Um, you know, we think of Mars as just being this kind of red planet due to all the oxide on there. Um, but if you get past the iron oxide, you find some really cool materials, um, you know, gypsum and clays and basalts and, and very Earth-like minerals. So this was the first tool to access the inside of rocks on Mars, and we built it in Manhattan. Um, Back then, Honeybee was down in, in the Lower East Side. We shipped this just a couple months after the Trade Towers um, uh, collapsed. And the, the, sh the, the motor shields, there are a couple actuators. I'm not sure if you can see here, but there are a couple actuators. And the, the, this is a shield right here. Uh, we actually used some, some uh, aluminum from the World Trade Center wreckage site uh, in the rover um, as kind of a tribute. Uh, after that, about uh, four years later, NASA sent the Phoenix lander up to the polar region where there's, there's known to be a lot of ice. And uh, we developed the, the Phoenix scoop, formerly, or formerly known as the icy soil acquisition device, to physically gather samples of, of water and bring it on board. Um, they had a, uh, a, bunch, a couple gas analyzing tools or, or instruments inside. Um, but the real challenge here is, is uh, Cryogenic ice, when you mix it with, with dust, is about as hard as concrete. It's like 10 to 20 uh, uh, megapascals. And you can't just scoop it like you would with a backhoe, uh, especially because this, this arm is a little over two meters. You just can't get any torque. So we, we put a little rasp on the back of the drill. And it sounds really painfully simple, but essentially you scrape off the top layer of soil put the back of the drill and preload it against the surface uh, and, then, and then hit it with the drill and you end up making some shave ice that's, that's kind of scooped up into this, um, this sample collection cup that you can then bring back onto some of the inlet ports on, on, the, robot, on the, the rover, so, uh, or on the lander rather. So uh, we built you know, the first tool to look inside rocks and then the first tool to, to taste the water. Um, and NASA got very excited and that leads us to curiosity. Um, so before I keep talking your ears off, any, any questions? Yes? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. We're going to blast through this, guys. Um, curiosity is chock full of instruments. Chem Cam is cool, but we're, we're mostly going to talk about SAM, the sample analysis at Mars Suite, which is a suite of four instruments. This is our fearless leader, Steve Gorvan, co-founder of the company with the uh, engineering test model at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And we built two tools, the dust removal tool, which is kind of a simplified rock abrasion tool to dust off samples so that ChemCam can hit it without being blinded by the iron oxide. And we also built the sample uh, analysis suite, pardon me, sample manipulation suite, which is like a carousel to um, move different samples around and uh, act like kind of a robotic lab assistant. And the reason this is important is 
inside the, the sample analysis at Mars Suite, you've got three instruments. But the challenge is to bring samples of rock or soil physically to the instruments. You know, it's very easy on Earth. Um, but this carousel device essentially moves samples without any cross-contamination to uh, the ovens. And the instruments don't actually look at the samples directly, but they, you, um, you, you heat the samples up slowly um, up to about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And you look at the gases that come off. And you can tell a lot about what's trapped inside. Um, we've got some nice glamour shots of people working on this. Everybody was very frustrated working in the bunny suits because um, you're trying to detect organics in the parts per billion range, and it's uh, sensitive to even things like you know scented deodorant. Um, so uh, it's quite a hassle to to work in a clean room. If you forget a tool, you gotta you know derobe and go back through the the air chamber a couple times. So we built the sample the sample manipulation system, bagged it up, sent it down to Goddard integrated it into this, this instrument suite. They bagged it up, sent it out to JPL, integrated it into the rover. And I don't know how you get the rover from JPL up to Vandenberg, but somehow they did it. And, uh, and it landed. And what you find is this very cool uh, view, almost like um, the Mojave Desert you know, down in SoCal. It landed in Gale Crater, which is a, uh, an old, uh, uh, I think it's about 150 kilometers wide. Uh, flood basin, and we, we tasted some of the rocks in the sample manipulation suite, had it go into an oven and, and analyzed it via these um, mass spectrometers and, and tunable laser spectrometers, and you find all this stuff comes off as you heat it up from about 500 to 1500 Fahrenheit. Um, you get oxygen and sulfur and nitrogen and carbon and 2 to 3 percent by weight water in what looks like completely arid rock. So what this tells us is we've got um, all the, all the compounds necessary for life, um, we found clay, which only forms in the presence of long-standing water that's not too salty, not too alkaline, not too basic. Um, and also the minerals that we found were in the right oxidation state to support life. Uh, you remember those, um, uh, they're called chemolithotropes, uh, uh, bacteria that live directly on, on reduced um, iron and other metals. And the, that's on Mars, even though the whole surface is oxidized. So you've got all the, all the um, environment for, uh, that could support life. And now the rover landed in, in the bottom of this, this uh, basin in what used to be like an old lake bed or, or river bed. Um, and we're trying to climb um, up the, the foothills of Mount Sharp in the middle, this five kilometer tall mountain. Yes. Um, I believe, I, yeah, this is a false color. Uh, it doesn't quite look so blue um, when you're on Mars. But um, uh, this is a, a telephoto view. And I think for, for clarity, they, they falsify the color. Um, and just to give you a little sense of scale, this, this rock right where the arrow is pointing is the size of the rover. So you know, navigation is a huge problem. And if you guys have seen uh, any coverage lately, there's the, the wheels are getting kind of banged up because they're extremely thin. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, 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 the operators say the wheels could be square and the motors have enough torque to keep this thing moving. So it seems like it's not probably a huge issue. Um, so we don't have a huge amount of time left. But I wanted to just dive into, for like five minutes, some of the sampling systems we've been working on because over the last 15 years, we've been uh, investing a huge amount of R&D resources into sampling from the surface and from deep and everything in between. And the whole idea is to act kind of like uh, everything from a field geologist to a commercial prospector using a robotic platform. Um, so you can see here we've got uh, going down from, from depth, from you know, very, very surface down to very deep. Um, and we've been doing this for, for well over 15 years, investing about 30 million in R&D funds. And this includes stuff like, if you don't want to land on a comet or an asteroid with, with um, very little gravitational pull, maybe you use a touch and go sampler where you just have a spacecraft um, and uh, essentially take a kind of a biopsy without ever landing. Um, we, and I can, I can share all these slides with you guys if you want. Uh, we have concepts for comet sampling systems. We have a small little craft that kind of does a, a, a kinetic dive into a comet. 
grabs a sample using, a, using a, an auger and then returns the sample back up to a mothership that would return uh, back to Earth or have onboard sampling systems. Uh, we've done things like uh, pneumatic sampling, so no moving parts, <laughs> using just um, gas that's often available on spacecraft. Um, essentially, embedded in each of these lander legs, like a Phoenix-style lander, you have um, this hollow tube with, with uh, gas holes. This thing is going to land a couple inches into dirt. And if you, if you pulse gas, it eventually, or essentially pushes all this regolith, all this dirt, up into a, through a sample collection tube into a chamber. Um, and you could uh, gather loose, disaggregated material without any moving pieces. Um, it's kind of cool. You can like sample about a thousand times as much dirt as uh, gas you need by, by mass. And then we've also done stuff like um, comet sampling systems using pyramidal um, uh, scoops. Again, almost like a horsefly mechanism where you're, you're biting into the surface of a very hard uh, comet that has cryogenic ice on the surface. Or taking a core sample using a very small uh, drill. This is a, a nano drill that um, weighs just, just about two pounds. You could use it uh, maybe for the asteroid redirect mission where astronauts are going to be trying to sample a, an asteroid in the late 2030s, or potentially um, an, a rover. And uh, also deep drills, so not just the traditional coring drills of the one meter class, um, but actually uh, going dozens or hundreds or even, even thousands of meters deep below the surface using a wireline architecture where you have this, this little scaffolding and this is a drill. Um, this is the Auto Gopher, about about um, kind of about 12 feet. This is the more recent uh, version we were just using out in the Salton Sea near Joshua Tree uh, in a gypsum quarry, about uh, it's about 15 or 16 feet tall. And the idea is um, you send it down a hole, and every 20 to 30 centimeters, it comes back up and drops off either a core sample or or or, uh, or drill shavings, and then goes right back down. And it can kind of brace itself. So it's, only li it's not limited to downforce, and it's not limited to the length of the drill string. It's just limited to the length of the tether that you're suspending it from for, for power and communications. Um, so we're thinking, you know, if you wanted to go through the crust of Enceladus or something, or Europa, you've got to go through potentially like 10 kilometers of ice. There's not enough power in a spacecraft, even a, even a nuclear reactor, to, to melt through it. So you probably have to drill through it, and some kind of wireline drill like this could, could be the solution. If you utilize a drill like this on, on a lunar landscape, you're quite likely to encounter a boulder on the way down. So yeah. How would you uh, do the replacement of the, of the end, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I don't think we've designed this yet for bit replacement. Um, so we, we have smaller coring drills that we were designing for rovers like Mars 2020, where you could do bit replacement, or even one sample per bit. Um, and, it's, and cache the sample with the bit in some kind of hermetically sealed chamber. Because, um, you know, Mars sample return is one of the, the, the um, or the preparation for Mars sample return is one of the missions for uh, Mars 2020. Um, I don't think we've looked at that yet for the wireline drill. In theory, it should be possible. We've got a, a carbide drill bit here that um, it's going through gypsum in a test because that's similar in hardness to cryogenic ice. Um, but yeah, if you hit like a boulder or something like made out of basalt or something really hard, um, you could degrade the bit really quickly. So that, yeah, there should be some swap out mechanism if you're expecting to find uh, hard samples. On that Mars 2020, the, um, why is there no idea or concept allowed of looking at the core samples, a core sample to see if it was good? In other words, to look at these, at the, uh, matrix that you're digging up yeah. instead of sealing them up and then leaving them as unknowns for future spacecraft. Is that just yeah. uh, an attempt to grab money from Congress that if you want these bits, you've got to come back and <laughs> pick them up again? Is that the, the intent? Um, we're, we're following the lead of the Jet Propulsion Lab, um, which is our, our main sponsor and benefactor for a lot of this research. Um, but we have developed some concepts for uh, bit architectures that have a slot in them, so you can image the whole length of the sample before you cache it. And in theory, you could you could toss out samples, yeah, that are that are low value. Yeah. Um, we've got a YouTube video actually. I could I could show you after the presentation. Were they responsive yeah. to that? I don't want to hear about 
Um, I'm not quite sure why JPL decided to go with its own. I mean, you know, we've been working on, on drills for a while, um, and for curiosity, JPL decided to build its own drill. Um, you know, and, and you know, in, in part, that's the role of, of companies like Honeybee is to try out, you know, different technologies and report back on what works and what doesn't so that NASA can be effective. Um, you know, but it's, it's, it's a little bit of a, uh, a strange situation to have uh, sponsored research um, by an organization that, that also is pursuing similar technology development. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of every project or the beginning and through the whole duration of every project, um, you know, we're trying to get cool technology that works out into space. So it's great if we can build it. But if JPL can learn from what we're doing, that's cool too. And uh, I know we're, we're running short on time. So the, the very last thing I wanted to mention is nobody's getting rich doing this. Um, we're not doing stuff that's wildly scalable. We're trying to build a, a, um, a sustainable business based on R&D and technology development. Uh, but what gets people fired up is the fact that we can, we can pay the bills and, and keep the lights on doing this. And also, things like this discovery from the first month that Opportunity was on Mars, um, there was a, a, a microscopic imager. After we, after we did a rat operation, we would take a picture. And I'm not sure if it really comes through here, but there's this sample that's, or this little, this little formation that's about the size of like a grain of rice, maybe three or four millimeters long. And it, it looks really um, compelling, right? Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, there was no way to verify what, what, was, what we're looking at here. You know, we had, we had some relatively primitive instruments compared to what's on Curiosity. And we had to keep driving. So there, there's this, these tantalizing clues um, that look like they might have been, you know, an old fossilized worm. But we don't have the overwhelming evidence yet. Um, and that's why things like curiosity uh, and sample return are so important, because you have, you have a lot more sophisticated instruments looking at um, what might have been either current or extant life on, on Mars. Yes. Um, I've, I've been to your offices on 34th Street a couple of times. And uh, could you just brag for a couple of minutes on, on the capabilities you have in-house to, to qual stuff to go on to a Mars uh, rover. Yeah, so um, NASA and, and aerospace customers are big on quality management. Um, so we're, we're consistent with um, ISO 9001 and also AS 9100, which is an aerospace standard. Um, we have a class 10,000 clean room um, out in California, and then class 100 laminar flow benches for, for uh, space qualified hardware. Uh, and you know, a huge amount of process knowledge about how to, how to put stuff together and, and engineer it for high reliability in extreme environments. And unfortunately, a lot of those skills are kind of orthogonal to building stuff that's very cost-effective or scalable for commercial systems. It's a very, very different skill set. So, you know, we're, we're in a position where traditionally we've done a lot of like onesie twosie um, development and some people want us to build stuff that, that's a little bit higher volume, like these pipe inspection rovers. So we're trying to do both at the same time, um, but uh, ISO 9001 I think is probably the, the key to a lot of the quality management that we're working on. Um, and when it comes to commercial space, AS9100 is, is important too. Um, but yeah, we got, actually we got the Golden Mop Award uh, from NASA for the cleanest um, uh, vendor <laughs> for Curiosity. So that was pretty cool. We built it you know, on the west side of Manhattan and it, it was probably the cleanest part of Manhattan at that point <laughs> outside of some surgical theater um, for, uh, you know, for, for space hardware. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a unique thing to be building in, in New York. Um, so if anybody's interested, this is my contact information. Um, drop me a line. We're based in the Navy Yard. Like I mentioned, we're in kind of a semi-temporary semi space. 
for what we hope is only another six months or so until a new lab is ready. Uh, but we're in building three, which is that big white building facing Flushing, if anybody ever goes by uh, the Navy Yard. Um, we welcome tours, uh, especially if people have some kind of connection to the aerospace or science community. Um, and I guess more than anything, you know, we're, we're excited about being part of a community here because uh, for a long time, Honeybee was kind of an island to itself. And it's fantastic to see the talent and the interests and the money coming in um, to build new space enterprises. So thank you for the opportunity to, to talk. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, funding. Have you yeah. got any outside investment, or has most of your money come from <coughs> contracts? With um, very early in the company's history, like the first two years or so, uh, there was like friends and family chipping in. But almost from the start, the, the idea was to be self-sufficient based on project revenue. So at this point, and we're doing high single digit millions of business per year. Um, and pretty much all of the money, or I should say all of the money is coming in from uh, government grants, procurement, and commercial contracts. Um, and you know, it's, it's freeing in that you're not responding to outside investors, like calling at two in the morning saying, what are you doing with my million bucks? Um, but it, it's also limiting in the fact that um, we don't have a huge internal R&D budget. And you know, we need to have people tell us what, what would be valuable for them to work on rather than like, pursuing our own, our own pipe dreams. So you know, there's been a lot of talent that, that comes through Honeybee works for a while, and then people like Chuck Hoberman leave to start their own agencies. Um, you know, or folks go to medical device companies or Google or, or other kind of a little bit deeper pocketed companies where you can, you can um, dream on a more, more commercial, uh, you know, line of thinking. Uh, but yeah, everything, it's all self-sustained by project funds. Are you getting, are you going to do any fundraising? Um, I don't think so. And not for Honeybee proper. We've, we've been thinking about spinning off maybe small ventures. So say if we have like a pipe inspection robot, um, that might be an interesting line of business, a little bit outside of our, our core expertise. Maybe we take that and build a, a small company around just that, that problem to be solved. Um, scale up manufacturing a little better, really focus on the problem, um, you know, add in some, some training uh, for service providers around the country. I think if, if we were going to fundraise, it would probably be for a, a little spin-off venture based on some IP rather than like for Honeybee proper. Because I've, I've gotten a sense when people give you money, they want to see big returns, and, and we're kind of in the slow and steady growth model, and no VC wants to see you grow at like, you know, eight or ten percent a year. That's it's not of interest. So, um, if we were going to take outside money, we would need to make sure there's some room for real growth, um, kind of like the go big or go home kind of model, rather than the slow and steady consulting model. Right, and, and obviously better in the commercial sector than the government sector because who knows what's going to happen there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and then there, there's there, there are a lot of companies like Moog and and. Um, Sierra Nevada um, that have you know built up much bigger enterprises around spacecraft subsystems and mechanisms so in theory we could we could scale up there um, but again I'm not sure it's like quite VC style money it might be more like debt or, or equity kind of thing I don't know yeah. we're, th we're thinking about it you yeah. yeah yeah <coughs> Would you say Honeybee's core expertise is more about robotics or drilling? Um, I think it's fundamentally uh, problem solving using robotics for you know, tough environments. I think that, that's our core expertise. So drilling and sampling and, and sample handling is definitely a subsystem of that. Um, but you know, we're working with companies in the oil and gas sector, infrastructure, uh, medical devices, uh, to kind of take a, a fresh look at how you could apply robotics for um, tight spaces or tough environments. And, and almost always, you know, if you've got an assembly line style robot, 
that, that's really good for like dull um, situations, but then you have like the dangerous and, and the dirty environments where you can't just buy a universal robotics or KUKA or ABB arm and retrofit it. Um, you need something that's, that's built specifically for the task. So, mo so most of the things, um, just to build on that, are, are very task specific. They're not, they're not general platforms. They're designed to do you know, one thing very effectively, um, which you know, can be limiting because it doesn't scale to multiple end users. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think you know, robotics for, for tough environments is the, the overarching um, specialty. Is, is, uh, is one of your drills on the NASA drill, rover, lunar rover that's going to be going one meter down into the dark space and it's on the moon? Uh, does that play to your strengths, that type of application? Yeah, we, we've, we've been looking at, at lunar prospecting and um, like drilling for, for water in the, the shadow of a crater down in the South Pole. Um, I'm not sure if we've announced whether we're a part of that, that mission yet. Um, and I feel like if it's, if it's been selected and we haven't, we haven't announced it, we're probably, we probably weren't selected. <laughs> um, is, it, is it already mature? I thought it was much, I thought it had been selected, so I'm curious. We've been, we've been w working with um, uh, Shackleton Energy and also uh, Lunar Mission One, which are both private ventures, um, I don't think we've, I don't think we've been selected for any upcoming NASA lunar rover that I'm aware of, though. So, um, if it's if it's already been chosen, uh, probably is happening without us, which is you know it, it happens. I mean, like like you think about the Japanese, uh, the the JAXA Hayabusa probe sampling from a comet, you know, they, they had a homegrown system. Um, we don't have a, a monopoly on space sampling. Um, but we, you know, we think we've got some, some special sauce. So we uh, crowdfunding mission? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's crowdfunding. And, you know, space crowdfunding has a kind of a, a, a tough road because it takes so much money even just to do feasibility and prototyping. Um, you know, so, you look at like um, Mars One, and and that model probably left a, a certain taste in the public's mouth. Um, I think it's I think it's an uphill battle to crowdfund enough to do a serious mission. You know, when you need a, when you need like twenty or thirty million dollars just to do, you know, all the functional prototype testing, it, that's that's a lot of donors. So uh, I think I think. Despite the interest in new space, there's still a role for NASA and deep-pocketed kind of long-term um, agencies to, to be funding some of this, this uh, primary research. Kind of the way like you know, NIH funds uh, very early stage drug discovery before, before private pharma um, tries to commercialize it. Thanks. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you.